them from being a Muslim is what affected the Prophet ﷺ so much. That if the Prophet was to respond and reciprocate their negativity, then he would be as low as them. So when they would harm the Messenger of Allah Islam, he would turn away. She, if you remember, I mentioned this previously, they would call the Prophet Mudamma. She would call the Prophet Mudamma. She was known for calling this. She would say Mudamma. Muhammad means the one who's praised. Dham means somebody who's disgraced. Mudamma is the one who's disgraced. So she would call him Mudamma. Every time she would see the Prophet, so verbal bullying, physical bullying, turning society against him continuously. And this is just one, one couple who are doing this continuously to the Prophet. This reached a stage where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu became very difficult for him to deal with uh, very early on. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala set a precedence here that anybody who wants to go down his way, you're going to be, end up going to hell with him. But don't, don't overstep your, your limit. Now what, what's interesting here is that within here, that there are four, there's different types of disbelievers. Not everybody, and again Imam Ghazali has some very lenient opinions in regards to this, but it's interesting anyway to say the least. We can't condemn any person who doesn't believe in Allah to help. Because number one, we don't know where we're going to go. Nobody here sitting here, including me, anyone, nobody can say, I am going to paradise or I have secured my own salvation. If you haven't secured your own salvation, then how on earth are you going to pass judgment on somebody else's salvation? And we are not like the Christians either, who say Jesus came to die for our sins and therefore we're going to go to paradise. Nothing is guaranteed. The Prophet will seek Allah's forgiveness 70 times a day. Allah the anqada dahrak the pressure would, just break, would be almost breaking his back to deal with this. So it was not something which was straightforward. But there are, according to Imam Ghazali here, that he was a 12th, 13th century theologian, that if, if the message has not reached somebody, then he won't be classed as a kafir because he hasn't actively engaged in disbelieving the message. He had a more lenient opinion also, this is not the mainstream opinion, but a more lenient opinion, that if the message has reached a person negatively, then he also is not responsible for it. Because the Muslims done a bad job portraying Islam. And I, and I, and I mentioned this on my Facebook too, is that one of the reasons, he, he, this is his quote, one of the reasons why there's so much disbelief on, this, disbelief on this earth is because how the Muslims actually portray Islam in a negative way. A kafir, linguistically, means, refers to a farmer. A'ajab al-kuffar, Allah mentions this in the Quran. Somebody who sows a seed into the ground and covers up it with soil. This is what the Prophet uh, Allah refers to as the ones who disbelieve. Because everybody has the seed of Iman in their heart. And when you cover that seed of Iman with disbelief, with, with kufr, with shirk, with, with sin, and multitude of darkness, like how you end up covering it with soil, your Iman, the light dies up. You, you're covering that seed. That's what Kafir actually refers to. Now there are different levels of people who are referred to as a kafir within it. Now I know, and, uh, when I was uh, delivering, I had an amazing opportunity, I was in, invited in, in what is it, Rothley, the outskirts of Leicester, Leicestershire, by the Conservative councillors, and Nicky Morgan's secretary also came there, a bunch of councillors and MPs, and they wanted to know about Islam. It was a, it was a UK, they said they were going to be losing their seats to UK, but also they wanted to try winning over Muslim voters. So they wanted a crash course on Islam, and they gave me the, the honour of actually uh, discussing an hour, they, they have the, the invite university uh, lecturers and stuff to deliver lectures for them. So they, they, they invited me to deliver a message. Again, non-Muslim environment. I met somebody with two PhDs. And I never met anybody with two PhDs before. Mm -hmm. Educated people. It was, it was a, is a invite only. So 45 interesting people who are very well educated. And and they were discussing the same ideas in regards to, you know, what what. Somebody said to me in the audience, I, don't, I was supposed to discuss Islam for one hour and have a Q&A for half an hour. We ended up, I ended up talking for two hours and had a Q&A for two hours. <laughs> it, it was such interesting questions. Anyway, somebody from the audience asked me that why do you Muslims refer to everyone else as infidels? Why do you refer to mm. And I said to him nicely that what's interesting here is that the word infidel actually comes from Christianity. Because it really, if you read the history of it, is that the word infidel was actually used for non-Christians. And it stems from Christianity. Like there you have the word Gentile for Hebrews who refer to non-Jewish people. And I was explaining to him, it's not necessarily a negative connotation to it. I know people say the Kafirahs, the Kufarahs, and the Mushrikin are Najis. We don't believe that. I hate when people, you know, in East London and all of these 
shall we have patrol gang? Stupid man, seriously. <laughs> they walk around, bruv, you, you're nudges, bruv. You don't come in our area. You come out, say that to people. You probably haven't watched your own backside, man. I'm telling other people. <laughs> if you can't use verses like this and apply them, generalize the whole of society or a community, in a, it's, it's misquoting the Quran. So, anyways, it's been, and that loads of interesting discussions. After the whole discussion we had, and somebody made a comment in the, in the audience. I started off my discussion by saying that you can't qualify to be a Muslim unless you believe in Jesus. And then we're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. You don't qualify to be a Muslim unless you believe in Jesus. And then I explained how we believe in all the prophets. And we had a whole load of, loads of questions. In fact, in fact, the, the person who introduced me, a 70-year-old uh, counselor, previously an MP, uh, he introduced me. He, he actually wrote the title for the discussion. He said, ISIS and the Quran. That was my title for the speech. <laughs> anyway, so whilst he's introducing me, he makes this point really funny. I find it funny. And he says, he says that the problem with uh, with uh, um, being living in a multicultural society and immigration is that sometimes we allow people of different faiths to come over. And the question is how how can how much can you keep on bending over for these people? <laughs> That's what he said. That was what this, that was what he said. And then he he, he said. The problem in bending over is the fact that sometimes you can fall back. Meaning you, when you over facilitate for people, you lose your own principles too. And the, he's, whilst he's introducing me, he's saying this. <laughs> so the first thing I said to him nicely is that, you know what, we are not here to push you guys over. And even if you do fall over, we're here to catch you. Because we are not here to cause you guys harm. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he actually uh, instilled the confidence back into the community that I'm not here to assert power or infringe rights. I'm here to actually uphold and empower the community. And this is what the Muslim role is. So when I'm talking about disbelievers here, we cannot write people off. You yourself, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention this again. My ustaz will say the same thing. See every non-Muslim as a potential Muslim and see your own self as a potential kafir. Harsh, but it's true. See yourself as a potential disbeliever. Because you don't know whether you're going to die with Iman. That's why we make the dua, Rabbana la tuzikh qulubana ba'adid hadithana. Don't cause my heart to go astray after you've guided me. Just because you've been guided, nothing guarantees you that you'll die on guidance. And it's a dua we make. So when I'm talking about disbelievers here, we have to have a more of an open scope in regards to this. So there are different types of disbelievers. A, a friendly disbeliever you can have. Somebody who's a good person. I mean, I'll say majority of the British population are like this. People who don't follow our religion, but are really, really nice people. In fact, some of the morals they have are much more better than ours too. Their, their characteristics, their akhlaq, their adab, the way they come across. And the examples of this is the likes of Abu Talib in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu he, did, he didn't accept it, Iman. He didn't accept Iman, but he was a good person towards the Messenger of Allah. Then you have somebody who's referred to as a noble enemy, who, who isn't, he was your enemy, who doesn't pretend to be your friend, but he hates what you stand for as a person. Right? And, and this is referred to as somebody in the Quran, that Abu Jahl. If that person was to become a Muslim, he would be a dynamic person. In fact, Umar radiallahu previously would also be in this category. Because the Messenger of the Middle Dua, oh Allah give either Abu Jahl or Umar radiallahu the opportunity to accept Iman. And Allah guided Umar radiallahu So he was a noble enemy. The third you have is that you have a wretched enemy, but not necessarily anything personal against the Prophet. So the second type was you don't like the idea of the belief system and therefore you're stepping against it. The third type is here is that the, 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 the person takes it personally against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also for what he stands for. So you had the likes here of Utba ibn Rabi'ah and Walid ibn Mughira. Walid ibn Mughira is the father of anyone? anyone guess? Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. Somebody mentioned that. Khalid ibn Walid. He was one of the... When, the, when Khalid ibn Walid accepted Islam, he knew that some verses had been revealed about his father. And the verses revealed by his father, in my opinion, are more harsh than what Allah said. Allah will have like, proper harsh. Like, and we'll discuss it next time. Like, line after line after line, about 10, 11 verses, continuously ripping into him. And then Allah, Allah talks, and then at the end, Allah says that he'll be thrown into hell. Now, Khalid already knew that some verses had been revealed. When he was about to accept Islam, he accepted Islam in Amr ibn al As, a close friend of his who liberated Egypt. Somebody told him, you know, you're going to accept Islam, you have to believe in a book that actually condemns your own father to hell. Are you showing him to be a Muslim? Iman had entered his heart, he wanted to accept Islam. The first thing he goes to Salim, who was one of the teachers of the Quran, and he says, you know what, I need to get this out of my chest. I have to recite those verses. 
And the books of hadith mention that the first thing he did after accepting Islam is he recited these 10, 11 verses. And he was condemning his own father to hell. Imagine the sacrifice of these Sahaba. You're reading a book that is condemning your own father to hell. This is Walid ibn Mughair, the third type of getaway. And then the fourth type is somebody who has absolute no moral, somebody who is against your personal message, somebody who hates you personally as a person, and a person who has a very negative influence in society, and that was Abu Lahab. Mm. And that's why he was exclusively pointed out and, and mentioned in, in, in such a way. I mean, the example of a wonderful woman with a wonderful wali, a guardian, is Maryam alayhi salam. She's an amazing woman.